Welcome back to Giant Monster Games, I'm Adrian, and today, by popular request, we are doing Budget Urzatron deck. Now, this deck is running in around $90, which is a little bit above my normal budget for budget decks. Normally, I want to keep them in the, like, $40 to $60, $70 range, but this is as low as I could possibly get it to keep that big budget, fast, aggressive Tron deck feel. Let's jump straight in, talking about what is Urzatron. Urzatron is the combination of three different cards, Urza's Power Plant, Urza's Mine, and Urza's Tower. Individually, these cards only produce one colorless mana each, but if you have one of each of these types of cards on the battlefield, they produce a total of seven mana, Power Plant and Mine producing two mana each, Tower producing three. So this is why it's referred to as Urzatron, because it's kind of like Voltron, where once they're all combined, they create a giant robot, which generally can smash our opponent in the face. Okay, they don't actually create a giant robot, but they do give us 7 mana, which we can use to summon something that is equivalent to a giant robot. While we're here, I should probably mention we're running playsets of each of these cards, so 4 mines, 4 power plants, and 4 towers. And seeing how we're on the subject of land, let's just finish up our mana base. Nothing else too special, only 8 forests, and a single lonely mountain. Moving over to spells, or mostly artifacts actually, we have four copies of Expedition Map. This is a key pillar to this deck because Expedition Map allows us to go and fetch any land, which means we can go and fetch whichever piece of the Urzatron lands we don't currently have. This is generally your best first turn play because if you have this in your opening hand, along with two other Urza lands, different ones obviously, you can guarantee have untapped Urzatron on turn three. But Expedition Map is not the only card we have that fetches up any land. We also have four copies of Sylvan Scrying, which is almost the same thing as Expedition Map. It allows us to fetch up any of our missing combo pieces, except it costs green mana to cast this. As you may have already noticed, the Urza lands don't produce green mana, which means either we need to play a forest, which slows us down by a turn, or we need to find another trick on how to play this card. Which takes me to our next card, four copies of Explore. Now this card allows us to play an additional land the turn we play it. And we also get to draw an extra card, so cantripping is always nice. An example series of plays, on turn one we play an Urza land, anything, and cast maybe any of our one-drop artifacts, which I'll cover in a second. Turn two we play a forest, we can play Explore, which means we can play a second Urza land. Then on turn three we can play Sylvan Scrying to fetch up our last Urza land we need, and complete Tron. Obviously we'll be down by at least one Urza land, so we'll only have five open mana, but it does open up some possibilities because we do have a four drop that is super handy. Now, I know what I just described sounds super janky, so let's talk about how we actually go about making green or any colored mana in this deck, and that is with our next series of one-drop artifacts. We have four copies of Chromatic Sphere, two copies of Chromatic Star, and three copies of Terrarium. Now, all of these cards are almost identical. They each have their own little differences to them, but they all provide us mana fixing, so we can convert our colorless Urza mana into whatever color we want, generally going to be green, and they all cantrip, so we can use them to draw cards and hopefully find Tron, or draw up our win conditions. The actual ideal play would be to play one of these on turn one, turn two, crack it, cast Sylvan Scrying, and then turn three, you have Tron again. But wait, there's more! The next card we have is two copies of Ancestral Stirrings. Now this is kind of a toolbox card in this deck because it allows us to look at the top five cards of our deck and put a colorless card into our hand. So that could be a land because all lands are colorless or one of our artifacts or, better yet, one of our win conditions. In summary, this card can be played early game or late game with value no matter what time you play it. And the last non-creature we're going to talk about is Priolus Vault. We're running two copies of this and it is replacing Oblivion Stone because Oblivion Stone is really expensive. It is going to be in the upgrade section, you'll see that in a second, but this allows us to wipe the board, so if we're against any kind of aggro strategy, any kind of mid-range strategy, combo decks, this allows us to completely wipe the board and then start over. Usually we're playing this when we already have Tron, wipe the board and then start playing our giant creatures to win the game. Which seems like a perfect segue to talk about said giant creatures. The first one we have is four copies of Bane of Balaged. Now this is the most vanilla win condition we have, and it also feels the most like an actual Tron deck card that you would actually normally see, because it is an Eldrazi, it is colorless, it costs seven mana, it is a 7-5, which means when it swings in it is going to do some serious damage, and it has the equivalent of Annihilator. It doesn't actually have the Annihilator keyword, because they didn't reprint that in Battle for Zendikar, but it is the exact same ability, which is whenever it attacks, defending player exiles two permanents he or she controls. Which, as you can guess, can easily close up the game if this creature attacks once or twice, because your opponent will have almost no board state left, and potentially even be losing lands. 
Carrying on, our next creature is Steel Hellkite, which is basically the giant robot I was talking about. We're running four copies of this guy, and it is a 5-5 flyer for six mana, which is awesome in itself, but it has a ton of upside. So one, you can pay two mana to make it bigger, give it plus one, plus oh until end of turn, but that's not the real reason why we're playing it. Its second ability is why it's in this deck, because it is crazy, which is whenever we swing in and attack with Steel Hellkite and it deals damage to a player, we may pay X mana and then destroy each permanent our opponent controls with converted mana cost X, whatever we paid. We can only do this once per turn, so we can't use it to completely wipe our opponent's board, but we can definitely use it to control our opponent so they can't get the advantage on us. If we need to go wide, we have Mere Battle Sphere. We're running four copies of this guy, and it is another robot for us because it is an artifact creature. I guess that's a robot if you consider it that way. It is a 4 7 for 7 by itself, but when it enters the battlefield, we create four 1 1 colorless Mere tokens, which is fantastic. We're getting tons of value right there. Plus, whenever Mere Battle Sphere attacks, we may tap any number of mirrors we have and give it plus X plus O, which is number of mirrors we tapped, plus it deals that much damage to our opponent. So you can see it has tons of utility. I'm sure you can find ways of making this card work very well for you. Our last creature, though, is two copies of World Breaker. Now, this guy tends to be another utility card for us. So not only is he a 5-7 seven for 7, he also has Recursion. We can sacrifice a land to bring him out of our graveyard back into our hand, so he's really hard for our opponent to kill if we do get into a graveyard. His main ability, which is why we have him in the deck, is whenever we cast him, we may exile target artifact, enchantment, or land. So we can use this to slow down other Tron decks. We can use this to slow down basically any deck that's running dual lands because we can target their least abundant land. We can also use this post sideboard to hopefully destroy stuff like Stony Silence or other cards that are going to give us a hard time because generally they tend to be artifacts or enchantments. So as you can see, it has tons of utility. I do want to point out before we actually wrap up our creature section that all of these creatures are seven or less mana to cast. Because we're not playing giant Eldrazi like Emrakul and Ulamog, which almost win you the game as soon as they come into play, I've made it so this deck is low to the ground in relative terms terms for Tron, that is, and we can generally be casting these creatures for their mana cost on turn 5 if we do get locked out and they destroy one of our Tron lands and remove it from our deck. So we're not completely out of the game if we do lose one of our combo pieces. We can still get these creatures under the board relatively fast and still be a threat even if we're not getting Tron. Now let's talk about our sideboard. The first card we have is three copies of Crumble to Dust. This is helping us deal with other Tron decks. It also kind of helps us with Ad Nauseam, Scape Shift, and any decks that are running three or more colors. Not necessarily an auto-include when you're going to be sideboarding, but it is something to keep in mind. Probably auto-include if it's Tron, actually. The next card we have is two copies of Fog. This is kind of self-explanatory. Then we have four copies of Nature's Claim. This is obviously targeting cards like Stony Silence, Pithing Needle, or any other card that's going to give us a hard time and not let us get Tron as fast as possible. This also gives us a little bit of hate for any deck that's running largely artifacts, so Lantern Control or Affinity. Then we have four copies of Pyroplasm. This is generally our aggro control spell. We're using this to wipe the board of creatures, usually. And last but not least, we have Ravenous Trap. We have two copies of this, and it's helping us deal with Dredge and some combo decks that rely on stuff going to the graveyard and then coming back out repeatedly. Example being the Heartless Mirror deck I did a few weeks ago back. That is the entire deck, but before we wrap up this video, let's talk about some upgrades. The first and easiest upgrade for this deck is to pull out all three copies of Terrarion and putting in two more copies of Chromatic Star and an additional Ancestral Stirring. I largely used Terrarion because it was a budget version of these cards, but the other cards are just substantially better. Oblivion Stone is a direct upgrade for Priorless Vault and is actually faster and better at dealing with aggro threats. The next few cards are all replacing our win conditions. The first one is Worm Coil Engine. This one here generally finds its way into most Tron decks because it has Lifelink and Death Touch and when it dies, not necessarily if it gets exiled, but when it dies, it actually creates two 3-3 creatures, one with lifelink and one with death touch. So it becomes really hard to just straight up kill this creature. The next two cards we have are Karn Liberated and Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Both of these cards have the ability to exile permanence. Karn has the ability to exile lands even, which is crazy. Their other abilities are also absolutely insane. Ugin being able to deal damage directly to creatures or your opponent, and Karn being able to destroy your opponent's hand. Once these guys get on the table, it becomes very hard for your opponent to deal with you. And lastly, we have the two cards that tend to be the poster child for Tron decks, Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger and Emrakul the Aeons Torn. Ulamog being one indestructible, two when it comes into play you exile two permanents, and three whenever it attacks your opponent puts the top 20 cards of their library into their graveyard. Literally he can attack three times and your opponent is guaranteed to be dead. And Emrakul may as well just read you win the game because it is uncounterable, when you cast it you take an extra turn, it has protection from colored spells so you can't path it or any you can't do anything to it. It also has flying and annihilator six so when it attacks your opponent has to exile six permanents, and if it's for some reason put into your graveyard somehow, it gets shuffled back into your library. So you can just kind of search it up again. It's absolutely insane.
And that concludes our Budget Tron deck. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to Giant Monster Games. Until next time, I'm Adrian, this is Giant Monster Games, and don't forget to game like a giant monster.